afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tracy Fullerton, as Martin's already told you, and I'm a game designer, and I'm the director of USC Games, which is the number one university program for game design in, in North America. Um, my job at USC is to educate the next generation of game developers in the art of design and the craft of development. But before I took that on, I worked in the industry for many years, developing games for uh, folks like Sony and Microsoft, Intel, MTV, and many others. I started my own company, and I worked for several other startup companies. And I've seen the inside of big development studios um, and very, very small ones. I've seen the industry change from uh, very, very little teams to very big ones and back again to little teams. Um, from little to no documentation to massive documentation and back again. Uh, there's um, no predetermined route for this industry. That's one thing I'm very, very sure of. What it is and what it can become is entirely in our hands. And that potential is huge, in my opinion. When I started teaching at USC, I told my students we could change the world if we change the way that people played. And I have seen them go out and start to make that happen, which is why I do what I do, spending my time educating new designers because I believe that games have the potential to become the primary aesthetic form of the coming century. Between their expanding reach into more ubiquitous platforms and broader audiences, and their emerging cultural status as an entertaining, expressive, educational medium, games are poised at a critical moment of definition and change. Today, I'd like to uh, invite you to ponder a thought exercise to kind of paint the picture of what I see might be possible for the future of play. Here are several predictions or guiding principles to set that stage for, the, for, the, for my thought exercise. Now, these may or may not come true, but I think they provide an interesting framework for discussion. First, I believe that the entertainment game industry, the heart of which is in this room uh, at this conference, will continue to evolve, expand, and segment until it is so broad and so pervasive it simply becomes part of the much larger digital entertainment spectrum. And by that I mean that everyone will play some segment of game, or they'll play it on some vestige of what we call a screen. And the concept of non-gamer will simply disappear. It will become as much of a lie as someone who tells you they don't watch television. Uh, in this broadening and segmenting, games will simply become one part of the mass digital entertainment spectrum that we all access every day. And second, I believe the cultural value of playful media as a part of this new seamless digital media spectrum will become very highly regarded, even more than the less tactile and less interactive media that we experience. The more that we're asked to invest and participate in a media, the more we will begin to value its experience in relation to our time, which is, of course, the most valuable thing we have to give these days. And third, I believe that po public social systems will by necessity, turn to playful designers for leadership. Forward-thinking cities and schools, hospitals and transit systems will have engagement designers who will craft the playful constraints of these systems, react to changes in their needs in an iterative way, and puppet master their daily usage. In short, game designers will be hired to run community campaigns to teach in playful situations and make us healthy and well in ways that go beyond drudgery and repetition. Now, these predictions are pretty far out there, I realize. But let's assume that at least some part of them comes to pass. What is our response as the trustees of game design as a discipline uh, and an art form, as the people standing on the bridge to that future holding the keys to the kingdom? First of all, you need to notice here that my focus here is not on the technology of games, so I believe that that will play an important part. It's on the art and the craft of games, the understanding of what makes playful systems work well, it is on game designers and the next generation that we produce. I think it's our duty to produce designers that are able to work across more disciplines and more domains than we've ever imagined. A designer of the generation that I'm supposing needs to be able to go beyond working with experts on the grand challenges of the world. And we, can, we need to begin training uh, these cross-disciplinary game design experts in learning in games, in healthcare in games, civic engagement in games in city planning and games, and more. And only these superheroes of game design will be ready and able to ride the wave of entrepreneurial and social possibilities that are certain to develop as society accepts and turns to playful constructs 
to answer more and more of our grand challenges. So what are some of the examples of these possibilities? Let's start with the big kahuna, education. We all know that education in our country is broken, possibly beyond fixing. But even one of the most div divisive, damaged systems that we've managed to create as humans, uh, within it there are still possibilities. Experiments are beginning to explore the deep link between learning and play. Something we as game designers have always known, I think. Uh, what part of a game is really not about learning? Uh, learning the system, the potentials, the combinations, the best strategies, the optimal solutions. No one tells you these, these things outright because it would ruin the play. It would ruin the learning course. So can you imagine a classroom where nobody wanted to copy the answers because it would ruin the fun of learning? It's, clear, it's clearly true that games are related to learning, but they are not necessarily related to efficient learning or standardized learning as it's valued in today's schools. The goal of a game is not to provide players with the most efficient experience possible. Instead, they're purposely imperfect system with intentional slippage in them in their mechanics that allows for players to actually play and discover. And this concept of inefficiency in learning is really impossible for most educators to understand. Uh, as a game designer who's worked with many experts in education to develop uh, playful interventions into classrooms, I can tell you this for sure. The kind of imperfection that makes games such good learning environments is not valued in our current educational system. But I think it could be, and I think that the stepping stone to getting there is by thinking about education and game design as a combined discipline. Let's imagine a world where we have a game designer who is also a teacher who understands the value of both disciplines, who can guide students through ex explorations of ideas, testing and failing, theorizing and strategizing, uh, building idea upon idea in challenging levels of play. And note that I'm not talking about software and how games can take the place of teachers. I think it's dangerous to think that games will solve issues of scale uh, or student to teacher ratio in classrooms. It's more important that we should be thinking about how they will solve issues of engagement. There are experiments in schools uh, like this right now, but I can imagine a world where a teacher without expertise in game design would be considered ill-prepared for the classroom. It's out there, I know, but bear with me because this kind of integration for us as an industry into the most meaningful parts of society is a critical turning point for us. So what about another huge challenge for our society? Healthcare and wellness. There are many people working on research games in both learning and healthcare, games that help you keep up with your fitness routine, that motivate you to do your physical therapy, that teach you about the systems that maintain or attack our bodies. Like games and learning, games and physical well-being are deeply intertwined in human history, but we've tended to specialize those games, sports, into activities we do when we're already healthy. Uh, as a person who resolutely spent the last year and a half walking five miles a day while going through chemotherapy, I've thought a lot about how we inadvertently have divorced playfulness from healthiness in our culture to our own disadvantage. And I'd like to see game designers with a deep expertise in playful healthcare regimens, or vice versa. Medical practitioners who understand the art of playfulness, as well as they understand human anatomy, physiology, and chemistry. Whoa, that was just to emphasize that point. <laughs> and then there's the domain of civic engagement in games, city planning in games. Just this past year, the city of Los Angeles ran an open call for proposals from designers of all kinds, but especially game designers, to envision the city in 2050. Advancing education, environment, qual environmental quality, health, social connectedness, arts and uh, cultural vitality, income and employment, housing and public safety. More and more cities are engaging in such open initiatives. And what's interesting to me is their willingness to look to games as potential solutions. Who will design these games? Will they be people who've learned the art of level design? Or will they be people who understand city planning? The answer is both, I think. And best, if these people are actually trained across these disciplines. The same can be said for games and architecture, games and social work, games and fine arts, and so on. Today, we're only training game designers with the expectations that they will go into this game industry. But more and more, I think we're going to see that the game industry is about to become a much larger concept, inclusive of many new kinds of cross-disciplinary expertise. And this broader industry will bring us into the mainstream of life, 
and society in ways that we can only imagine today. So am I saying that the entirety of life and education ought to be about games, that everyone will be a game designer in the future? No, not really, though it sounds fun to me. Um, what I am saying is that a certain level of literacy in playful design may actually become as important as reading and writing and basic math are to most information age careers. I'm saying that the expertise that you have today in procedurality, in systems thinking, in playful constructs, may be critically important to all literate citizens in the United, in, in, well, actually worldwide in the future. You are all wizards, everyone. So how will you use your powers? What would it mean to develop such superheroes of game design? And what differences could they make in our world? I propose that they could make all the difference, but in order to move past the moment that we're in today, this moment of wonderful potential, and into what might be called an age of play, we as an industry must actually fight for the right to claim this next phase of possibility for our art form and for our business. And to do so, we need to battle some fairly important bosses that stand in our way. The first boss we need to defeat is our own limited view of games and their place in entertainment and culture. We've all made a great living on games as they are, uh, but imagine the bigger possibilities here when games and game professionals are in demand beyond the entertainment spectrum. I know this has been preached before and resulted in what people have called chocolate-covered broccoli. And look, there are always many factors that come into play when you're approaching new markets. Innovation doesn't happen in one foul swoop, and it doesn't succeed if the conditions aren't right. But those conditions are changing. Um, and if we keep pointing at old ventures and say, it will never work, then yes, indeed, it will never work until someone makes it work. And then the common wisdom will change, and suddenly everyone will be a believer. But you can subvert this process. You can let yourself imagine a broader vista for games, one that doesn't deny their entertainment core, but is open and inclusive to new players and new markets. It's easy if you try. And the next big boss standing in our way is our own exclusive and heterogeneous community of development. We've been making some progress in this, I think, but it still remains one of the biggest requirements for making games a part of our broader society. If we want everyone to play, then everyone really needs to be able to make. It's not a simple problem either, because it isn't like you can just run an ad and expect that women and minorities will come apply. That's like saying, hey, here's a frat party we're having over here, and if you want to come, you're invited. But we're not going to do anything different. We're not actually inviting you, but we'd be you know, able to say that you came. So how many people do you know would respond to such a half-hearted invitation? Not many. Listen. If we want an inclusive and diverse industry, we've really got to mean it when we invite everyone over to play. And that means changing the culture of development. It means making it possible for designers and developers to balance their life goals with their career goals. It means creating safe places, like decision-making processes where people in the minority feel safe, giving their real opinions on creative concepts, and hearing and respecting those opinions. And it means finding a way to inspire an entirely different segment of the up-and-coming generation to imagine themselves as game designers and developers. Frankly, I don't see, think it's impossible. And I've been in situations where I've seen young people of all kinds start thinking about a potential future where they have the power of play and code and games in their hands, and what would they do with it if they could? We've seen some great strides in these areas recently, and I hope that we can fulfill on the promise. I want to shout out to Layla Shabir from uh, Girls Make Games and Kate Edwards at the IGDA, and of course, Intel for their amazing generosity. So now let's get to work on our Latino game designers and our African American game designers and our LGBTQ game designers. We need gifts just as generous to support all the missing game designers in our community. And I swear to God, we can change the face of the industry. But as we've seen this year, we may need to defend ourselves against our own carefully cultivated hardcore audience. Those who want to keep games just as they are to themselves and see the advancements of the form as a threat to their identity and their own sense of entitlement. The industry as a whole, let's be honest, has cultivated this sense of entitlement. We've capitalized on it, really. And honestly, that focus on one segment of the game playing public is unique to digital games. Before the early 90s, uh, games were a pastime for everyone. Go back and look at the history. J.P. Dyson is here. He'll tell you about it. 
Uh, the history of games uh, before the 90s were a pastime for everyone. Um, you'll find ads um, over the, the, the course of, of the evolving industrialization of play for families, for girls and boys and women and men. There was no such thing as a gamer. We were all gamers, and we all, and we all need to take back that sense of play for everyone. But the status quo is resilient. And when I look back more than a decade ago, when I decided to go into academia and take on this challenge of training a generation of game designers with a greater purpose, I thought it might take some time. I had no idea. That was 11 years ago. And back then, when I told those early students that we can make different games and we can change the world, I honestly thought that by now things would be so much better than they are. My strategy was based on the idea of change through influence. That if I could make a tribe of game designers with this broader sense of social purpose, that I could affect more change in 10 years than I ever could on my own. I honestly believe we have moved the needle, but I could have never realized back then how much change needed to happen. I thought change had to happen in the industry, but I didn't realize that change had to happen throughout the wider culture as well. So we have progress, but we don't have an end in sight. I know now that we must all become ambassadors of change in our own right and face the next boss level together. I submit to you that the next 10 years may be the most important that the game industry has ever faced. If we don't move to change ourselves as a community, we won't reach the potential I've spoken of. The prize in front of us is a bigger industry than we've ever imagined, one that spans into so many societal realms that has such a grand sense of cultural purpose and potential impact, it simply glitters with opportunity. Are you ready to come and bring on this age of play? As decision makers, as creative leaders, financial backers, developers, and yes, educators, we must all play important roles in defining how the future of games will play out. And today I'm making a challenge to each of us to maximize our efforts towards helping games reach their full potential influence as a global medium of expression for all players and all creators of play everywhere. The next 10 years will certainly prove full of challenges and contradictions as these possibilities play out. But for us, in this field of games, uncertainty is a wonderful thing because we are large. We contain multitudes. Thank you for listening. Good luck to us all.